flitting, floating, falling on the ground. I freeze on children's eyelashes and blur their altered vision of the world. They see a different earth than I, of candy and playgrounds and eternal smiles. I see the truth. Cold, bare trees, stripped of life and hard ground. This poem appeared in the student literary magazine, Sementeam, at Shaker Heights High School. It was written by a young woman named Lisa Pruitt 28 years ago. There's something in the water in Shaker Heights that produces great writers. Or maybe it was just a really good English teacher. Lisa Pruitt was a classmate of Katherine Schultz, a staff writer for The New Yorker, who won a Pulitzer last year. A few years later, the novelist Celeste Ng became the co-editor of that same literary magazine. There's every reason to believe that Lisa would have been a successful writer, too. But on the night of September 13, 1990, someone stabbed Lisa 21 times and left her to die behind a mansion on the corner of Lee and South Woodland. If you've never been to Cleveland, you have to first understand that the city is divided straight down the center by the Cuyahoga River. The author Mark Weingartner, in his excellent novel Crooked River Burning, explains the etymology of the word Cleveland when discussing the strangeness of the North Coast city. Originally, it was Cleveland, spelled C-L-E-A-V-E. The word cleave is an autoantonym, a word that is also its opposite. Cleave can mean to join together, or it can mean to sever. Or as Weingartner puts it, it's the Cuyahoga River that puts the cleave in Cleveland, separating East from Midwest, integration from segregation, a place that sees itself as America's westernmost eastern city from a place that sees itself as the easternmost Midwestern city. The rest of the country sees it as neither, though it must be said that the rest of the country is perversely wont to misunderstand Cleveland. End quote. The west side is predominantly white, the east side black. West side is middle class, east side is poor. The exception to the rule of the east side is Shaker Heights, which is an affluent suburb, but on the border of eastern Cleveland, so it has a very diverse school system. There's the poor side of Shaker Heights, and there's the rich side of Shaker Heights, and little in between. Perhaps it's this displayed disparity of affluence that makes for great writers. Lisa's murder divided the town down the middle, too. I want to say a little more about Lisa before we get into everything that went wrong. She had just turned 16, she was outgoing, had a lot of friends. She was on student council, a member of the marching band, active in softball and field hockey, as well as the school paper. The day of her murder, she took her driver's test and got her license. It was a good day. Shaker Heights was a safe town. Who would ever want to harm this young woman here? Enter Kevin Young. At Shaker Heights High, Kevin Young was known as the troubled kid. He had outbursts in school, and sometimes blew up at other students. He was handsome, a genius at chess, but troubled. When a girl declined to go out with him during a band trip to Toronto, he threatened to jump off the hotel balcony. They hospitalized him, medicated him, but he stopped taking his meds in October of 1989. After the murder, two students, Shane McGee and John George, reported that they'd overheard Kevin talking about how he wanted to kill Lisa and her boyfriend because he had been in love with her and she'd chosen a different boy. The local media got wind that Shaker Heights detectives were focusing on Kevin Young. Kevin's father, the reporters knew, was a powerful local attorney with friends in government. At the height of the investigation, Kevin was admitted to a mental hospital where detectives could not question him. Was his father hiding him? Was there a conspiracy to keep Kevin out of prison? A patient at the mental hospital who befriended Kevin went to prosecutors upon her release and told them that Kevin had confessed. Kevin was arrested for the murder. The trial was broadcast on court TV in 1993. And then Kevin was found not guilty of the crime and Cleveland lost its damn mind. Readers wanted justice, so the reporters hounded Kevin until he climbed onto a bridge and threatened to jump. Luckily, they talked him down. Decades later, most residents of Shaker Heights still believe Kevin got away with murder. It's what the prosecutors told them. 
It's what the newspapers reported. But the detectives who pushed Kevin Young as a suspect forgot an important tool of investigations, Occam's razor. It's clear to me that if someone inside the Shaker Heights police station had calmly applied this technique, Kevin Young would never have been charged with murder, and Lisa's real killer would be in prison today. I'm James Renner, and this is The Philosophy of Crime. If you've read a lot of crime novels or binge-watched murder shows on ID Discovery, you've probably heard of Occam's Razor before. On Reddit, where super sleuths gather on the Unresolved Mysteries sub, it's often used as a catty diss, as in, why are you all so interested in this mystery? Occam's Razor tells us it was likely the butler that did it. LOL. But what is Occam's Razor? And are we using it correctly? In Latin, there was this idea known as lex parsimonia, the law of parsimony, which favors the most economical means to an explanation. The law of parsimony was debated by philosophers for centuries and used by Aristotle, but the technique was eventually named after this dude William of Ockham, a Franciscan friar who lived around the turn of the century. The 14th century, that is. The Franciscans were all about emulating the life of Jesus Christ. They owned no property and begged for food in the streets when they weren't preaching. When the reigning pope took issue with this idea of extreme poverty, Occam and his followers fled Avignon and settled in Bavaria. Somewhere in his travels, William of Occam came up with a more direct way of interpreting the contradictions of life, the universe, and everything. To quote, Entities must not be multiplied beyond necessity. To paraphrase, Among competing hypotheses, the one with the fewest assumptions should be selected. That's key. Occam's razor is not necessarily the simplest explanation, it's the explanation that makes the least assumptions. If there's more than one way to explain an event, the least complicated answer is likely to be true. There was one important exception for William of Ockham. Anything to do with God or divine intervention was to be taken on faith alone. Things like the Immaculate Conception and the Resurrection did not require further explanations beyond the Bible. Ockham's razor was for the world of man. But even though William of Ockham never used his razor to cut down religion, it didn't keep others from doing so. By the time of Galileo Galilei and the invention of the telescope, the argument that the Earth was the center of the universe became overly complicated and difficult to defend. For the geocentric model to work, the planets and their moons and the sun had to be contained inside invisible, mystical spheres. But if the sun was simply the center of our observable universe— the motions of each celestial object was simplified. Even the church had to admit the simplest answer made sense and a kind of truce was made with the world of science. Conduct your experiments. Just kindly leave the miracles of the Bible out of it. Out of this came the scientific method. Simple, testable, repeatable science. Patience. Answers. And we used the razor to chip away at the unknown all around us. Versions of Occam's razor became mantras for other studies as well. In medicine, when doctors consider a patient's diagnosis, they remind themselves that when they hear hoofbeats, they should not think zebras. The simplest diagnosis is usually correct, so it's probably not lupus if a migraine explains what's going on. Even House knew that. Occam's razor fits well with mathematics, specifically probability theory. They believe that all assumptions introduce possibilities for error. Sherlock Holmes knew a thing or two about probability. He was a citizen detective who used the law of parsimony to look for the obvious that everybody else could not see. The solution is elementary, my dear Watson. The thing we have forgotten is that Occam's razor was always meant to be just a mental tool, what's called a heuristic, an approach to problem solving. The razor was never meant to be an end, but a means to an end. So how do we use Occam's razor as an investigative tool for unsolved mysteries? Good detectives would do well to consider it when listening to a suspect's alleged alibi. Is the alibi more complicated than another explanation? I'll give you an easy real-world example. When 16-year-old Teresa Ann Beer disappeared in June of 1987, police had a decent suspect. 
Teresa had gone hiking into the wilderness of the Sierra Nevada mountains with 43-year-old Skip Welch. They'd set up camp near Shut Eye Peak on June 1st, but only Skip returned home. When police questioned him, Skip told them Bigfoot had abducted the girl. With no body and no evidence, prosecutors let him go. To this day, Teresa Beer's case remains unsolved, and Skip remains free. For Skip's story to be true, we must first believe that the mythical Sasquatch exists, and that it happened upon them in the wilderness, and then abducted her without harming Skip. A simpler solution is that Skip was responsible for her death in some way. To believe this, we don't have to believe in mythical creatures or happenstance. We only have to believe something about the intentions of a 43-year-old man camping out with a 16-year-old girl. Occam's Razor says, all things being equal, Skip Welch is probably a damn dirty liar. Now take a look at the murder of John F. Kennedy. What's more likely? That Kennedy was murdered as part of a far-reaching conspiracy involving the CIA and Cuba? That a dozen or so men who were involved never told a soul? That they got away with it without leaving a trace of the conspiracy behind? Or was Kennedy's murder the actions of one lone, disgruntled man? What does Occam's Razor suggest is the true answer? There are those who hate Occam's Razor because it's no fun. Occam's Razor dismisses conspiracy whenever possible. It doesn't make for good television or good podcasts, probably. Oliver Stone will never make a movie about a guy who's really good at using Occam's Razor. And instinctively, we almost hate it. There's something that seems to be in the human makeup that wishes, against all evidence, that the conspiracy is true. We are blessed with an imagination that allows us to dream up the most wonderful things. But it also has this dark side, this side that craves paranoia. I had this idea for a science fiction story, it's probably already been done, where we learn that imagination is a disease. That it's a communicable disease that eventually most humans contract, like HPV, and we eventually learn to adapt and live with it, or it drives us mad. I wrote a book not too long ago called True Crime Addict. It was about the Maura Murray case. If you don't know about it, Maura Murray was a nursing student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in 2004. One Monday morning in February, Maura emailed her professors and said there'd been a death in the family and to hold her work until the end of the week. That was a lie, by the way. There'd been no death in her family. Maura packed up her room and placed an email from her boyfriend on top of the boxes. The email talked about how he had cheated on her. She called several hotels and cabins in New Hampshire, inquiring about places with two rooms. She visited an ATM and withdrew pretty much all of her money. She stopped at a liquor store and bought a lot of booze, way more than one person would need. Then she drove into the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Around 7.30 that night, Her car crashes into a snowbank on Route 112. A woman in a nearby house heard the crash and called 911. The time between the call and the first responding officer was between three and seven minutes. Sometime in that window, Maura vanished. When her friends back at UMass found out she was missing, they told her family in the press that they had no idea what Maura was up to. That's a woefully short summary, by the way. Morris' case, in my opinion, becomes truly fascinating when you discover her secrets, getting caught stealing makeup at Fort Knox, her affair with a track coach, stolen credit cards, and identity theft. But I digress. Moore's case is catnip to conspiracy theorists and ad hoc hypotheses, and nobody likes to use Occam's razor because it kills the fun. There are two popular theories as to what happened to Maura Murray in those seven minutes she was standing on the side of the road. One, that Mora was abducted by a killer. Two, that Mora was murdered by a police officer and the murder was covered up by his friends. In order to believe the first story, one has to believe a killer happened to be driving down that stretch of road in that small window of time on that exact day. A test was conducted a year later. A private investigator counted the number of cars that drove by the site of the accident at that time of night. There were seven. You have to believe that a man capable of murder got lucky enough to drive by at that time and get away with Mora without the neighbors seeing him pick her up. Then he had to take her somewhere, murder her without getting caught, 
and dump her body in such a way that searches never found it. To believe the second story, one has to believe several policemen covered up a cold-blooded murder by one of their own, never told a soul, and never got caught. The police conspiracy group hung their hopes on an eyewitness sighting of a police SUV seen parked nose-to-nose with Moore's car after the accident. That must be the killer's car, they said. But when the officer who responded to the accident was interviewed for a documentary last year, he explained that that was his SUV. He'd simply been responding to the 911 call. He'd parked nose-to-nose so traffic could get by. As soon as this explanation was given, the Tinfoil Hat Club simply altered their narrative. There must have been two police cars there that night. Maybe Mora hid in her trunk and was taken later after the car was towed. Or maybe Mora ran down a side road and was picked up by a murdery cop there. A much simpler explanation is that Mora's friends lied when asked if Mora had told them what she was up to. If Mora was traveling with friends, it also explains all the messy details, like the extra liquor, the search for condos with two bedrooms, and how she got out of there so quickly. She was traveling with a tandem driver, and they picked her up in another vehicle. Some grand conspiracy? A perfect crime? Or a simple getaway with friends? Of course, my explanation only explains the disappearance, not what ultimately happened to Mora. Did she run away? Was she murdered after the disappearance at another location by person or persons unknown? There's this story I recall reading years ago, I want to say it was a quote by Stephen King, but I can't trace it back to any single work of his. I'm paraphrasing and probably buggering it up real bad, but it pretty much went like this. An old woman lived in a house at the end of a country road. Her husband took care of things like the mail and bills, but one day he died of a heart attack, leaving her all alone. The old woman was superstitious and afraid to be by herself, And over the course of several days, she became convinced that an alien was trying to get into her house to abduct her and take her away to Altair 4 or something. Every day at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, some creature crept onto her porch and made some noise and then walked away. Finally, she realized that she had to put a stop to this before the creature got inside and abducted her. So she got her husband's old shotgun out from beneath the bed and then waited just inside her front door until she heard it approach at two o'clock. She saw a shadow through the window and knew it was just outside. She turned and fired two shells through the door. She heard it fall, dead. She got up and opened the door only to find the mailman's body on her porch, bleeding into the wood. And she said to herself with surprise, who would have thought the mailman was a damned alien? Don't ascribe to conspiracy what can be explained by stupidity. So if Kevin Young didn't kill Lisa Pruitt, who the hell did? Can we look at the particulars of the case and apply Occam's razor? First, let's consider the location of Lisa's body. Behind a mansion at the corner of South Woodland and Lee, she'd been stabbed 21 times. The murder weapon was nowhere to be found. Her body lay 30 feet from the back door of her boyfriend's house. His name was Dan Dreifert. Earlier that day, Lisa and Dan had made plans to meet up that night. Lisa was going to sneak out of her house and ride her bike to his place. As they were discussing the plans, Dan was getting his hair cut by a neighbor girl with a pair of shears. He joked with Lisa that he was going to surprise her later and cut her hair too. That was an important day for both Lisa and Dan, and there was reason to celebrate. Lisa had passed her driver's exam Dan had just been released from the psych ward. He had written letters to Lisa during his time there. I'm going to quote one of those letters. Someday, I'll go too far and do something very bad, and you'll yell at me and be serious and I won't be able to handle it. But you can't let me get away with murder. End quote. When the police arrived on scene in the early morning hours of September 14th, the stories Dan and his father gave were bizarre. First, Dan said he had forgotten Lisa was coming over, so he was in his room when he heard the scream. By the time the screaming had stopped, Dan was in his parents' room. According to his father, Robert, Dan was already dressed and wearing shoes. Robert himself was naked, so he asked Dan to go see what was going on. 
Look, I wasn't there. I have no idea what happened that night. But I'm a father. I own my own house. Not as nice as the Dreyfords mansion, but nice enough. For one, I'm not going to let my kid wear their shoes in their bedroom. For another thing, I'm sure as hell not sending my son outside to investigate a scream before I go out there and see what's going on. The next day, Dan's friends went to the police and pointed the finger at Kevin. From that moment on, Kevin was the lead suspect. There was no physical evidence connecting him to the crime or the scene. The school kids directed the investigation like a modern-day crucible, and the police did everything they could to make it fit, short of throwing Kevin into Lake Erie to see if he'd float. At one point, they even hired a psychiatrist, Dr. Murray Myron of Syracuse University, to help them get a confession out of Kevin. When Dr. Myron heard about the boyfriend, he asked why they weren't focusing on him. The detective told him to concentrate on Kevin. So Dr. Myron agreed, in his words, to operant condition Kevin, to clockwork orange Kevin, like that movie. They never did get their confession. Kevin Young lived out the remainder of his days in Shaker Heights, a child prodigy who could only find a job painting houses. He died last year at the age of 44. Stress and drinking took its toll on his body. If Shaker Heights detectives had taken a moment and used Occam's razor back in 1990, Kevin Young might still be alive, and her real killer would be behind bars. It's hard to see the forest for the trees sometimes. We're emotional beings, after all. We don't automatically look for the most logical solution. Instead, we look for the solution that will cause us the least amount of pain and anguish. Better to think a killer is the weird kid in school than a friend you trusted. Better to believe in the boogeyman than to fear the man who lives beside you. The Philosophy of Crime is a Fearful Symmetry production. This episode was produced and recorded by William Mankey. I'm James Renner. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can find links to all of my books at jamesrenner.com. My latest, True Crime Addict, is about my investigation into the bizarre disappearance of Maura Murray. As well as producing and recording this episode, William Mankey also writes the music for the podcast. You can find the other things he makes at boxwoodpinball.com. I'm often asked if writing about crime makes me more fearful of the world. The opposite is true, actually. We hear about these terrible crimes only because they are so rare. And there's one simple thing that each of us can do to make abductions and kidnappings even more rare. We can spend a little time making friends with our neighbors. If everyone took the time to really get to know the people who live to the left of us and to the right of us, we'd be able to recognize who needs help in this world. Don't be afraid. Make more friends.